Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture which we read just a few moments ago, Exodus chapter 15. As you know, over the last several weeks, we have been looking at the ten times that the Jews rebelled against God in their wilderness wanderings. We've looked in detail at test number one, where they tested, uh, which tested the rebellion against God's ordained leadership, and Israel not only failed that test on the first occurrence, but they failed it most of the other ten times, uh, in addition to the <laughs> added tests that they were given at those points. The rebellion test number two was that when Ezra was tested, whether or not they would walk by faith in the face of pain. Unfortunately, they uh, responded instead with bitterness and anger instead of faith at Mara, and that test taught us seven important things about suffering in the Christian life. First, God designs pain in our lives to cause us to trust him and take our eyes off of temporal things. Second, suffering comes before blessing and pain comes before joy. Third, the third principle we learned was that the walk of faith is essential to a productive, joyful Christian life. Fourth, we learned that walking by faith is required for heavenly rewards. Fifth, we learned from Mara that is failure to walk by faith is rebellion in the eyes of God. Sixth, we learned from Mara that it, in every category of faith testing that any believer can ever face is found in Hebrews 11 because each hero of faith gives to us an example of how to respond to that particular type of test. You've never faced anything unique. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common, common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. That's a great promise, folks. Every, every test of your faith that comes in your life is a common test, and God has guaranteed he will never be too strong for you, and God has guaranteed that he will provide a way of escape for you. But seventh, and perhaps the most important principle that we learned from Mara is that if you refuse to walk by faith, it is impossible for you to please God. And we saw two subpoints under that. When you refuse to walk by faith, there are at least two results. Number one, your premature death. Number two, your loss of heavenly rewards. So to summarize, the first two failures of Israel in the wilderness, failure number one was rebellion against God's ordained leadership is rebellion against God. Failure number two, refusing to walk by faith, is rebellion against God. Walking by faith is a habitual lifestyle, not an occasional sporadic New Year's resolution to do better. better. We saw there were three takeaway lessons from the rebellion at Marah. One, having a bitter spirit is rebellion against God because it blames him for doing evil when he meant it for good. Second, refusal to walk by faith and refusal to walk in the spirit is also counted by God as rebellion. And number three, refusal to accept the test and disciplines of God is rebellion against God. You say, I don't want to take the test. I don't want to take the test. I'm going to sit here, fold my arms, and I will not put anything down on the paper. <laughs> well, that's just as bad as deliberately putting down the wrong answers. So the last time together in Exodus, I added some new material. Uh, we had finished our overview of walking by faith, so I entitled that subsection, Fear is the Opposite of Faith. And we, see th we saw that contrast <clears throat> clearly set out in Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4. And um, I gave you a challenge to memorize those two verses. So if you didn't memorize those verses and you still have fear in your life, it's your own fault, and you will continue to be miserable until you learn those verses and apply them to whatever fear you face. Just to, out of curiosity, how many of you all memorized Psalm 56, 3 and 4? <laughs> okay, one, one person. Good, good. I'm glad that one person did. Well, if you get, still got fear in your life, maybe it's because you haven't got those verses embedded, not just in your head, but embedded in your heart. Remember? What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. He said, well, okay, that's a pretty good verse. What time am I afraid I will trust in thee? Let's see if we can say it together. We can memorize one verse. That's a short one. Let's say it together. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Now, you just got the first one of those two verses. Now, the next is a little longer. We're not going to try to memorize it here. But in God, I will praise his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Those are two great verses that deal with fear. You ought to memorize them. 
Psalm 56, 3 and 4. Let's say the reference together. Psalm 56, 3 and 4. Now, how many of you have written it down now? Good. A whole bunch more hands now. Okay, that's the way. All right. Fear, folks, destroys your Christian life. It destroys your Christian life. The devil loves it when you're afraid. The world loves it when you're afraid because they've got a control grip on you. <laughs> I can twist you around like this. The world loves you to be afraid because then you don't have a testimony to the world. Oh, dear folks, don't let it control you because suddenly it cancels out power, love, sound mind. That's what Paul says, 2 Timothy 1.7, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. That's why we are not to fear, and we're given a specific reason. Proverbs 29.25, the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. That verse shows us there's also a contrast between the fear of man and the fear of the Lord. And we looked at a bunch of those passages dealing with the fear of the Lord. I won't go over all of them, but we covered quite a few. We covered them in Second Chronicles, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, uh, Isaiah, even in the book of Acts. The fear of the Lord is a powerful thing. By the fear of the Lord are riches and honor in life. <laughs> People, you want God's riches and honor and life, the fear of the Lord is how you get it. Book of Acts said, Then have the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Maybe because we don't have the fear of the Lord, maybe that's one of the reasons why we don't grow. Maybe we've got too much of the fear of man instead of having the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the holy, which is understanding. That's what the Bible says. That's where wisdom starts. You have no wisdom if you don't have the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The book of James tells us, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it Oh, it might be given to him, but, you know, God's on vacation most of the time, so you really can't expect... No, that's not what it says. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is as a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Did you notice fear and faith set in contrast by James in the New Testament? This is not just an Old Testament principle. If any of you lack wisdom, lack, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. I want you all to walk by faith. That's my heart's desire. To see everybody in this church have the joy of the Lord so pouring through their lives that they don't care what the world, flesh, devil, and demons say about it. They are going to walk by faith because they're holding hands with Jesus. That's power, folks. And that's what caused the church in the New Testament to grow. The churches had rest throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Instead, God commands us not to be afraid of people and circumstances of life because he's with us. The phrase, fear not, fear not, occurs 62 times in the Bible. You think God's trying to make a point? I mean, when, when you're getting to other phrases in Scripture or other doctrines in Scripture, you don't find some of the words. You just find definition or uh, descriptions instead of uh, specific words, like the doctrine of the Trinity, for example. But it's there. But fear not, because we are people of fear. We are afraid kind of people. We're scaredy cats. Sixty-two times God has to tell us, Fear not. 
So if you missed the first time, then you got a second shot at it. If you missed it the second time, you got a third shot at it. If you missed it the third time, you got a fourth shot at it. If you missed the 57th time, you got a 58th shot at it, all the way down to 62. And it's all over both the Old Testament and the New Testament. We looked at a few of those last uh, time. We looked in the book of Genesis. We looked in the book of Deuteronomy. We looked in the book of Joshua. I love the ones in the book of Joshua. Joshua said to them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage. For thus shall the Lord do all to all your enemies against whom you fight. They just wiped them out. Never be afraid. God is there. We looked at it in Judges. We looked at it in Kings. We looked at it in Chronicles. Huh. We are not to be afraid of people and circumstances of life. It doesn't matter what you face. They are defeated foes. Even Satan was defeated at the cross. And all of his demons are less than he is. You do not have to be afraid of them. A time I will, am afraid I will trust in thee. Oh, we have a good God. We have promises of scripture. So today, if possible, I want to finish our study on fear is the opposite of faith. First, I want to look at a few more verses that give us specific reasons not to be afraid. Now, last time we looked at these verses about not fearing, we didn't cover reasons. Today, I want to look at a bunch of new verses which have specific reasons that we do not have to be afraid. So I hope you're taking some notes because you know, you'll find arguments that you should be afraid here, but then you can go back in a specific reason because there's a specific verse that tells you why you don't have to be afraid, not just don't be afraid. I mean, God commands it, so that should be a good enough reason. God says don't do it, then we shouldn't do it. I mean, we're disobeying when we are afraid. But because God is kind to us, he gives us specific reasons why we don't have to be afraid. I'm going to hopefully cover a few of those. The commands not to be afraid are not just a matter of keeping a stiff upper lip or whistling in the dark. The commands are coupled with personal promises from the omnipotent God who made the universe. Is he big enough? The omnipotent God. He made everything there is. He made the sun. He made the moon. He made the stars. He made some of the planets. Jupiter is big enough that if it was hollow, you could rattle a whole bunch of our suns around inside, or our, our, our earths around inside of it. There are stars out there that are so big that if they were hollow, you could rattle a bunch of our suns around inside of it. That's the God who made a promise to you. We're going to cover some of those promises today as to why you don't have to be afraid. The commands are coupled with God's personal promises, the one who made the universe. Now, let me just boil that down to basic bare essentials. Either God, when he makes the promises, either God is lying to us or he is telling the truth. Those are your only two options. I mean, there's no cloudy, you know, mystical kind of stuff here. He says specific things. He makes it very clear. So we only have two choices. Is God lying to us? Is God telling us the truth? You can't cut it any other way. Now, when you hear these promises, you don't say, oh, that sounds like Nostradamus and all these weird wobbly kind of things out there that, you know, predictions that sort of might come true any old way. God has specific promises. So if you refuse to believe and act on his promises, you are calling God a liar. How many of you think that's a serious issue to call God a liar? You think it's a serious issue? I think it's a serious issue if you call God a liar. Okay, let me give you the first one. It's Isaiah 35, verse 4. This has three promises connected to it. There's a command and three promises. There's a specific target audience. That's, the target audience is scared people. The command is don't fear. And then three promises are attached to why. Gives you reasons why not to. Isaiah 35, 4. Say to them that are of a fearful heart. Okay, so here's our target audience. People who have a fearful heart, okay? Now here's the command. Be strong, fear not. And then the three reasons why you don't have to be. Behold, number one, your God will come with vengeance. What are you scared of? You know what? God's going to 
whack him hard. He's going to come with vengeance to destroy whatever it is that's making you afraid. Number one, your God will come with vengeance. Number two, even God with a recompense, he will pay them back so hard they won't know what hit them. With a recompense. Promise number three, and here's the reason you don't need to be afraid. He's not just going to come back and smack a bunch of bad guys around. He will come and save you. That's the reason you don't have to be afraid. He will come and save you. He's not just going to come and pull you out and let the bad guys keep. He's going to come with a vengeance. He's going to pay them back like they never saw anything like it. In life. And it's for the purpose he's going to pull you out. He's going to save you, but he's going to smack them when he does it. Those are pretty good promises. And those are pretty good reasons why we do not need to be afraid. Here's one reason in Isaiah 41, 13. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Now, you know, sometimes I, I see a little Carice down here in the front row holding her daddy or mommy's hand, and you know, she feels very comfortable. She feels protected because these are big people taking care of one little teeny weeny girl. And she knows they're okay. That's what God says. The Lord thy God will hold thy right hand. You know, I, I can remember sometimes when we went through the zoo and you'd, you see the big, big animals out there, and you see bears and lions and tigers. And sometimes some of our more timid kids, now, not many of my kids are timid, but, but there are a few of them that were timid. When they were little, they would come over and they would hold my hand and squeeze real close to me as we were looking into the lion's cage or the tiger's cage like that. They would hold my hand. Just think of God as an omnipotent parent, and anytime you want, you can reach up and he'll hold your hand. And he says to you, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. What's the reason? Well, I might help you if I feel like it today. No, that's not what it says, is it? It says, I will help thee. That's a pretty good reason not to be afraid. God gives us specific reasons connected to promises from the eternal God who never lies. I will help thee. We see it again in, in the very next verse. I mean, two verses in a row, God wants you to get the point. Fear not. Now, you woolly, fuzzy little nice lamb that everybody loves. No, that's not what he says. Fear not, thou worm, Jacob. <laughs> How many of you love to hold hands with worms? Yeah. Any, any fishermen? Well, I heard a yuck down here. <laughs> yeah. God says, you know, it's not because you're so nice. It's not because you're so good. It's not because you're so beautiful. It's not because you're so warm and cuddly and fuzzy. He says, don't fear. You are a worm, but I love the worm. Fear not, thou worm Jacob and ye men of Israel. I will help thee. Not I might help thee. It's an absolute promise. I will help thee, saith the Lord. That's Jehovah, all capitals, L-O-R-D. That's the name Yahweh, the covenant God. And thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. God describes himself in three ways when he says, I will help you. Just so you don't miss it, who's going to help you? It's Yahweh, Jehovah. It's the Redeemer. The Redeemer will help you. Who is our Redeemer? Jesus. And can we always trust him or does he sometimes back up on his word? He's the Holy One of Israel. Folks, that's powerful. He doesn't let anything escape his notice. He is holy. Above all else, perfect, righteous, never lies, omnipotent, always powerful, and has made a promise to you, he will help you. Let's look over two chapters farther, Isaiah 43, verse 1. 
Here again, we have three reasons why we do not need to be afraid. God does things in triplets quite often. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee. And again, it's L-O-R-D, it's capitals. Jehovah that created thee, O God, uh, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel. So we're talking about the creator here. Fear not. Now there's the command. And there are three reasons he gives. Three reasons we don't have to be afraid. Four. Number one, I have redeemed thee. Now let me ask us a question here. How many of you have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? You've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You know, that's the reason you don't have to be afraid. You have been redeemed. Jehovah God says, number one reason not to be afraid, I have redeemed thee. Reason number two, I have called thee by thy name. He's not just talking about a big swath of people out there. Okay, all you guys, I've redeemed you. You know, go do your fun thing. And if you're scared, well, that's too, too much of a problem for me. I, I can't handle No. I have called thee by name. Does God know your name? He sure does. Suppose I were to say, here's this group of people, and all you thousands sitting out there in Radio Atlanta, um, suppose I said, um, Kirk, come up here. Would all the rest of you come up here, or would only Kirk come up here? Well, I don't know if Kirk would come up here, but if God said, <laughs> come up here and preach for me, brother. Uh, but if God said it, you think Kirk would get up out of his seat and come up to the front? Yeah, I think he would. Yeah, absolutely. And if God said, I want you to come up here because I'm going to protect you up here, Kirk would jump out of his seat and come running up. That's the reason you don't have to be afraid. Because God knows you by name. The rest of you wouldn't come if I called the name Kirk. But Kirk would come. God says, reason number one that you don't have to be afraid is I've redeemed you. Reason number two, I have called thee by name. Reason number three, and this is so beautiful, thou art mine. You don't belong to anybody else. Somebody else may try to take you, somebody else may try to grab you, but you belong to him. Thou art mine. Now, think back with me a few years. Some of you knew some of my kids 10 years ago. I think I had six or seven of them living at home at that point. And um, anyway, imagine us with those kids and all their older siblings going on a cross-country trip, which we did. We had a 15-passenger van, which was just big enough to hold the 13 kids and the two parents. And we drove across country. And uh, suppose we stop at some gas station out in the middle of Nebraska somewhere, and um, this uh, old man and old lady come up to us and they say, uh, wow, those are really nice kids, but you've got an awful lot of them and we don't have any, so we're going to take this one. And they grab the hands of one of the kids, one old lady and one old man, on one side, and they start to walk off with them. And I say, wait a minute, you can't have that kid. That kid is mine. Do you think I would have done that? I would have done a lot worse than that, too. I'd have really? knocked them to the ground and grabbed the kid and thrown him in the van. Really? You know, yeah, I sure would have. Those are mine. Well, I mean, do you think about you, Carice? Do you think if, if somebody came and tried to walk away with you, do you think your parents would object? I think she would. They would object. Yes, they would. I think they would have tackled. Yeah, they would tackle those persons, wouldn't they? Well, folks, that's what God says about you. Here's a reason you don't have to be afraid. He gives you a specific reason because he says, you are mine. You are mine. Jesus said, no man can pluck them out of my hand, my father's hand. Nobody can pluck them out of my hand. My father which gave them me is greater than all and no man can pluck them out of his hand. I and my father are one. You're his. 
How much did he love you? Enough to send Jesus to die for you? That's how much he loves you. He's not going to let anybody take you. You belong to him. That's reason number three. Magnificent verse there, Isaiah 43, 1. Here's another one, Isaiah 43, 5. Here's the reason. First the command, fear not. Then he tells you the reason. For I am with thee. You know, the New Testament tells us he'll never leave us nor forsake us. It doesn't matter where you are on planet Earth. It doesn't matter whether you get in a spacesuit and go up to the International Space Station and hang out there for a while. He has promised that he's always right there. You cannot get away from him. David says, oh, I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the depths of hell, you're there. He's with you. All you have to do is reach up and hold his hand when you're afraid. Remember the promises that he's given to you. Nothing should cause you to fear because you have him. And he's always with you. That's a pretty good reason not to be afraid. He's always with you. Here, Isaiah 40, 44, verse 2. <laughs> Isaiah talks a lot about this. Did you ever get the idea that <laughs> the audience to whom Isaiah is writing might have been a fearful audience? Isaiah is some of the greatest promises concerning our Lord Jesus Christ in the entire scripture. You know Isaiah 53. That's why we don't have to be afraid. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? We shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness, that when we should see him there is any beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. People, who's he talking about? Who is that? It's Jesus. Isaiah is the great prophet about Jesus. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and I shall call his name Emmanuel. Those are all Isaiah. And he's telling you that's why you don't have to be afraid. He's the great prophet that tells us, fear not. Let me give you some more. Isaiah 44, verse 2. Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb. Here's the creator God, the one that watched over you as you were developing in the womb of your mother. Which will help thee. Fear not. Y'all have seen little baby Jacob. Do you think his mother would help him? Is he too weak to help himself? Yes. Does she take good care of him? Yep, she sure does. And you know what? Your mama's took good care of each one of you too. That's right. Give your mom a hug. <laughs> the faith of a child, folks, that's what we need. Every one of us. The form thee in the womb, I will help thee, fear not. And then he goes on, and he tells you why. Here's the reason why. O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. That's why you don't have to be afraid. God chose you. That's the magnificent doctrine of election. That's the magnificent doctrine of predestination. That's the magnificent doctrine of the sovereignty of God. That's why you don't have to be afraid. And that's the reason that God gives to you. Whom I have chosen. Let's jump over to another book. Our time is flying here. Jeremiah chapter 46 verse 27. Again, talking to fearful people. But fear not, thou, O my servant Jacob. Be not dismayed, O Israel. Now listen to this. 
Here's a good reason why you don't. You say, but God seems so far away. You know, God doesn't seem like somebody I can call on right now because he seems to be far away. Okay, let's listen to this. Behold, I will save thee from afar off. <laughs> you think I'm not there? You feel like you're, you're far away from me? You feel like I, 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 there's nowhere to, to turn? You feel like the heavens are brass? God says, okay, not a problem for me. Behold, I will save thee from afar off. And thy seed from the land of their captivity and Jacob shall return and be in rest and at ease. And look at the next phrase in this, in this verse. And none shall make him afraid. Oh, folks, when you're walking with God, he can save you near or far. He'll do it because he's redeemed you. He'll do it because he's chosen you. He'll do it because you're his child. He will do it because he has called you by name. He'll do it because you are his. You are mine. He'll do it with a vengeance against those who are threatening you. He'll come with a recompense for anybody who's done bad to you. Be not dismayed. None shall make him afraid. Let me give you one out of Lamentations. Lamentations 3.57 Thou drewest near in the day that I called upon thee, thou saidst, fear not. I can remember there were times when we were in a store and one of the little kids sort of wandered around and said, and all of a sudden we heard this little voice at the top of its lungs saying, Ema! <laughs> you know, that's the, how they called Judy was Ema, means mommy in Hebrew, uh, or Abba! And of course, what do we do? Immediately we ran to where they were. And that's what it says in the, Thou drewest near in the day that I called upon thee, thou saidst, fear not. We'd run over and grab the kid and hug him. Say, you don't have to be afraid. It's okay. It's okay. How many of you as parents ever said that to you? It's okay. It's okay. You hug the kid. Have any of you ever done that with your children? Yes, of course. It's okay. It's okay. People, this is a God who loves you more than your parents ever did. This is a God who loved you more than any other human being ever did. This is a God who says, you belong to me. These are reasons you don't have to be afraid. I'm there. If you think I'm far off, I can still hear you afar off. If you call to me, I'm there. I'm ready to help you. But you've got to call. How about Daniel? Here we have uh, some more reasons given to us, at least two in this verse. Daniel 10, 12. Then said unto he, he unto me, this is the angel speaking to Daniel. Fear not, Daniel, for, here's the first reason, from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand. You know, that indicates that Daniel had to do something. He didn't understand what was going on. Have you ever been in a circumstance, and here's Daniel, he's in captivity. But he wants to understand what the scripture says, Jeremiah and the rest of the prophets Concerning the end of the captivity, he doesn't understand. But he set his heart on it. He set his focus on it. You got a purpose in your heart. You got some problem you're looking at? You purpose in your heart to understand it. From the first day, from the first day, not from the second day, you didn't have to bang on God's door for 13 weeks before he said, okay, well, we'll get around to it. And to two, here's the second thing, chasten thyself before God. In the context, it's talking about Daniel repenting, not only for his own sins, but for the sins of the Jewish people. You're coming to God saying, Lord, I got this problem. I really want to understand it. If there's anything in my life that is sin, show it to me so I can confess it to you. I want to be in fellowship with you because I know when I'm not in fellowship with you, I'm in trouble. It might be your hand that's chastening me. So show me. Now, there may not be anything that's standing between you and God in terms of sin in your life, but it's a possibility. And Daniel, a righteous man, one of the three men in the Bible that are called righteous men, Daniel had come before God and said, Lord, if there's some reason I don't understand why this is going on, show me. I confess my sins and the sins of my people. 
Sometimes, folks, the problems that are in our lives are of our own doing. Not all the time. Sometimes God is just refining us as by fire. But sometimes it's because of our stupidity. Because we're walking along in the flesh, doing what we ought not to be doing, and we knew it was, not, it was wrong, but we hardened our conscience. We've seared our conscience. We've decided to go ahead and do it anyway. And so God sends us little reminders, little hornets that come and sting us. <laughs> you know, they, ooh, that hurt. And they keep on going. And we keep walking closer to the, the hornet's nest, and ooh, there's another one got me. We might want to say, Lord, am I walking the wrong direction? Am I doing the wrong thing? Am I out of fellowship with you? Am I not walking by faith? We've been talking about that, of course, in our messages. Walking by faith is pleasing to God. Walking not by faith is rebellion against God. When you're walking in faith, you have no fear. Sometimes that may be the problem. But that's what he says here. From the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand. That was principle number one. Principle number three. And to chasten thyself before God. Thy words were heard and I am come for thy words. You don't have to be afraid. God sends an answer. In this case he sent the angel. Angel Gabriel. But you know. Daniel had to get right with God first. A man who was a righteous man. Daniel wanted to know answers. Based on scripture. Lord, I don't understand this. It looks like things are happening around me. I'd like to understand this principle here so that I can interact with it. We're doing studies on that kind of thing in the evening in the book of Revelation. Do you really want to understand? Do you really want to know what's going on in the world around us? Do sometimes you think, whoa, that crazy guy over in North Korea, or man, you know, what's happening with Russia interfering with presidential elections? Or, you know, what's happening with this school shooting that just, just took place down in Florida? And, and do you want to understand? Have you set your heart to it? You know the understanding comes from the Word of God. Maybe you don't understand because you're fitting in with a pattern of sin that makes you think that those guys, what are doing whatever, are okay. Be Daniel. How about Daniel chapter 10, verse 19? Here we have two reasons not to be afraid. And he said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Not only is God mechanically there for you, you're greatly beloved. How many of you like the feeling of love? <laughs> I saw these little hands go up here, yeah. How many of you like the feeling of love? Greatly beloved, not just sort of loved. That's what God has for you. You are greatly beloved. Loved more than any woman can love a man. Loved more than any man can love a woman. Loved more than any parent can love a child. Loved more than any child can love a parent. Loved more than any friend can love a friend. That's the first reason in this verse why you don't have to be afraid because you are greatly beloved. Listen to the second reason. Fear not. Peace be unto thee. Be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken to me, I was strengthened. The second reason he gives is when you understand that he loves you. Second reason he gives you peace and he gives you strength. Peace and strength. Jesus said the same thing to his disciples in John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, what's the next promise? 
I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether ye go, whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's all tied together. You're great beloved. He died for you. He promised he's coming back for you. You are his. He bought you with his blood. There is no reason to be afraid. These principles that I'm giving you out of the Old Testament, these are all in the New Testament. And they are all centered on the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace be unto thee. Be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Those are great promises. I've got to keep moving. Let me jump over to the book of Joel. Here's the command. Same thing we've seen in every one of the verses. That phrase has showed up in every one of these verses I've, sh I've talked to you about. Fear not. Starts with fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice. Now, here's the reason he gives why you don't have to be afraid. And on the opposite, you can be happy. You don't have to be afraid. You can... How many of you prefer being happy to being scared? You prefer being happy? Okay. So here it is. So he says... Be glad and rejoice. Now here's your reason. For the Lord will do great things. Oh, oh God's going to uh, do a little bitty something over here. He's going to come by and throw you a piece of bubble gum. Is that what it says? Uh, the Lord will do some little thing. He'll come over here and sweep the corner of your kitchen. What does it say? The Lord will do what? Tell me. Great things. The Lord will do great things. That's your God. That's the one who says, you are mine. That's the one who says, you are my greatly beloved. When somebody loves somebody else, do they just do piddly little things for them or do they try to do great things, the best they can do? The great things, the best they can do, right? Yes, amen. They don't try to take from you. They try to give to you. They don't do it with ulterior motives of later putting a wedge on you and manipulating you and using that as a crowbar and saying, well, I gave you such and such and I want you to give me this. That's not love. That's lust. That's abuse. That's manipulation. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Do you think he did it so he can get something from you? Are you worth the Lamb of God? No. God didn't do it so he could get something out of you. Oh, there are a lot of people in the world who use those kind of manipulative tools against members of the opposite sex so they can somehow get something out of them. But that's not how God loves. You are greatly beloved to him. You're infinitely precious in his sight. As we saw last Sunday on the film, you are made in the image of God that gives you infinite worth. It's a great message, a great preaching session. I wish you could have all seen it. When you go into a situation, you don't have to be manipulated because you realize you are made in the image of God and you are of infinite value to him. And if you go into that situation thinking that you are going to somehow control or get something out of the other person, be careful because that person is made in the image of God. And they are infinitely valuable. You are infinitely valuable. You are greatly beloved. And for you, the Lord will do great things. How about Zechariah chapter 8? Verse 13, this is the last one in the Old Testament. We've got still a bunch in the New Testament, which really it was where I wanted to get today. But Zechariah 8, verse 13, And it shall come to pass that as you were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, now listen, so I will save you, and ye shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. So there's the command, don't fear. And the two reasons, I will save you. And you know what? 
It's not God is just saving us all the time. He's saving us. Oh, he's pulling us out of this, and he's pulling us out of that, and he's pulling us out of that one. Over. Oh, 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 you're up here. Pull us out of that one. Pull us out. He's going to do something with you. Why, well, you don't have to be afraid. Did you catch the second one there? I will save you. Here's the second one. Ye shall be a blessing. Not you will be blessed. You shall be a blessing. That's why you don't have to be afraid. God is going to use you. God is going to take you and make you into a blessing for others. Oh, dear friends. You think, how can God use me? I'm just a piece of trash. God can take the worst degenerate sinner and transform them into the image of Christ. And he can use them for their joy and for his glory. He can make them a blessing. Do you know how much delight and joy I have in my heart when I realize that I have been a blessing to someone else? That gives me joy. And God can take you, you worm, Jacob! <laughs> God lets them see themselves as they are. You're a worm. And not a very nice looking worm either. You're all covered with dirt and slime. You worm, I'm going to make you a blessing. Not just I'm going to bless you. God promises that. But he says, I'm going to make you a blessing. That's a great reason not to be afraid. He'll strengthen you because you're his. He'll protect you because he's chosen you. He will hear you when you're near or when you're far off. And he's not only going to save you, he's not only going to bless you, but he's going to make you a blessing to someone else. Good reasons not to be afraid. He loves you. You are dearly beloved. Now either God's telling you the truth or God is lying to you. That's where we started. How you respond to this message in relation to fear will be a positive declaration of whether you believe God because you act on the basis of his word or whether you call God a liar because you refuse to believe it and you refuse to act on the basis of it. Those are your only two options. Don't let the devil pull you into the second option. You can trust God. There is nobody as strong as he is. He has never lied. In all the history of the world, he has kept every promise that he ever made to every person who is his child. Will you walk by faith? Will you trust him? And he will drive away the fears from you. You have his word on it. The Lord willing, we'll cover the New Testament passages on that next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the power of your word. We thank you that you are God and that there is nothing too hard for you. Father, as we go through life, each one of us face different fears. Oh, we have all these little things that we stumble over instead of keeping our eyes straight ahead on the goal. Instead of looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Help us to keep our eyes on Jesus, because Jesus loves us and gave himself for us and will hear us when we cry from afar and tells us, take my right hand, I will uphold thee. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will strengthen thee. And Father, we thank you that he promises to give us his perfect peace and joy and make us a blessing. Help us, Father, not just to have it in our head, but to have it in our hearts and to live by faith. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.